is Meredith Sands Cater, and I'm trained extensively in shiatsu and acupuncture. And the whole focus of my life's work has been compiling what we understand in Western physiology and Eastern energy systems. And by Eastern energy systems, can everyone hear me now? By Eastern energy systems, I mean meridians, chakras, Taoist belts of tension, uh, the Taoist dantians, Ayurvedic nadis, the concepts of kundalini, what that means, and what the ancient texts have always been saying about it. So what I do is I teach accelerated healing skills to people who work with the body, whether it's in massage or um, craniosacral or chiropractic or acupuncture. Um, naturopathic medicine, anyone who works with the body or anyone who has a body who wants to understand how to actually access our, um, our nervous systems directly. The issue with Western medicine right now is we have, we're, we're focused on matter, chemical constituents and that which we can see and that which we can quantify. And the thing is, is that only 0.00001% is matter in the world, and the other 99.999% is the vacuum that we haven't quite yet quantified. So if we're only dealing with this extremely small fraction within the body, we're kind of using half of our brain, as opposed to being able to use the 5,000 years of Eastern histories. We're using less than 200 years of Western medicine. And we're about, to, the exciting thing is we're about to really learn from each of them and see how they fuse. And so we're walking into a really exciting future. And that's really the message that I'm here to talk about, is the excitement of where we're going as opposed to what's dismal and what needs to change. We're looking at the more negentropic, expansive view of what's going on. I, I met somebody at a conference a couple of weeks ago and her very close friend is 32, she's had two children and she's just about to have both of her breasts removed and her uterus removed on the off chance that she might get cancer because her mother had cancer and she has the genetic marker. Okay, this is actually becoming a very common occurrence in Western surgical theaters, they used to be called. Um, and this is not in any way a slam against Western medicine. I have doctors in my family. A lot of us wouldn't be here today if it weren't for antibiotics and surgical intervention. So I have deep respect for it. However, at this point, the practice of actually removing body parts, which is fairly prevalent now in Western medicine in order to prevent disease, negates the fact that there's actually an electrical and energetic component to the body that is feeding the source energy through the body. And by removing different parts of the body, we're, not, we're actually reducing the energetic quantity and flow of what can happen within the body. So for instance, in ancient China and in ancient India, it was considered that doctors would only get paid, doctors would only get paid when their patients were healthy. And there's actually even an old Sanskrit um, text in Ayurveda that says it's better for a doctor to swallow molten lead than it is to take money from a sick person. So this is really significant because this social ethos has been on this planet for thousands of years. And so the vision I want to share with you today is the fact that it's only been in the last couple of hundred that that's really changed in the Western world and where we're coming from and what we're doing. We've actually done a 180 in order for a beautiful science to be able to discover what it's discovered. And now it's time for us to actually start integrating what it is that the East has always known with meridians, with chakras, with Taoist belts of tension, with all of the different things. So, how, bless you. So, how many of you actually, should I show of hands, work with the body in one form or another? You know, in, in massage or acupuncture, craniosacral, so about half the room. And, okay, and then, and then how many of you have a body? <laughs> Just checking. Physical if, body. If you don't, sorry? Physical body. Right. So, if you don't have a body, you're already healed, and that's a different talk. <laughs> but thank you for coming anyway. And, um, and if you do have a body, you are really a healer. You are a healer, and you're in fact the most profound healer that you know. And I want you just to absorb that for a second. If you have a body, you are the most profound healer that you know. And I come from a line of people who have always worked with the body, medically, alternatively, otherwise. So really being a student of the body was naturally in my blood, and so I really started that, that journey quite some time ago. Somewhere between the end of a, a, a two-year full-time shiatsu in Eastern Diagnostic Program and the beginning of my acupuncture studies, uh, I, had, I had a really life-changing experience. And we're, we're all having some pretty out-of-the-box experiences at this point, and so I know you know what I'm talking about. And we all have a different way of having that 
express itself to us. And mine really changed my entire headspace because nobody had told me that it was a possibility for the kind of experience that I had to exist, certainly in the default world. So my experience was I felt like it was five million volts of energy that shot up my spine. And so I understood later that this is commonly understood as a, a Kundalini experience. And that's a word that we throw around a lot that some people understand well, some people don't understand as well. My experience was that I was living in Toronto on the East Coast in the early 90s where guys were not hugging each other saying that they missed each other in yoga class. You know, it was a very different world. And it wasn't the West Coast kind of awareness that we're living in now. So I didn't have a belief system in which to understand what had happened. And it wasn't just a rush of energy up my spine. It really radically scrambled my entire nervous system. It really felt like somebody had turned up the static on a, on a radio station so high. And my brain frequency could not, could not tolerate what was going on. So I spent a month in, in really what I would call deep psychosis and, and a huge amount of fear because I didn't have a belief system in which to understand this. And after a month of that, uh, to make a very long and painful story short, I had an evening and a day of utter and profound bliss. And that whole experience and the download that I got and the bliss of the full potential of the source energy that we come from and the full potential that we have changed my life and left me only with the question of trying to find out what that was and why I'm here, why we're here, and why we're dying and where we're going. And so that has really been my life's passion. And anyone who knows me knows that that's really all I think and talk and breathe about. So I'm very happy today to talk to you about some concepts and some ideas um, 17 years later, almost 20 years later, as to how this relates to your energy system, your aches and pains, where our medicine's going, and, and what you can do about it. Um, so today's talk is called, um, what's it called? It's called Fractal Anatomy and the New Economy of Health. So, I, I mean, imagine for a moment in our medical crisis and all the discussion in America about health care and who pays for it and what's going on. Imagine if 80% of the people, or a high percentage, that's okay, Violet, just leave it. Thank you for trying. Thanks. Imagine if there were infinitely less people in need for surgery or in hospital rooms. I mean, suddenly we would have to actually change the concept as to who was getting paid for what. I mean, imagine if people were feeling good and doctors like in the ancient times were like, I feel good, do you feel good? Fantastic, give me money. Everybody would be happy. And right now, we unfortunately live in a situation where if you are ill, doctors get rich. And it's not because they're bad people. It's not because that's, it's just the way that our capitalistic world has set things up. And it's us who make the changes of what's going on. Because nobody tells you what to eat but you. Nobody tells you what to consume, whether you're gonna get up off the couch and do something about your depression or reach out for help when you need help for your illness or who it is that you associate with and what's going on in your environment. And those are all really critical factors and we know that, diet and exercise and meditation, right living, working on our stuff helps us actually thrive. And in the past, what they had was a medicine that was based on thriving as opposed to surviving. And right now, it's the other way around. So the inspiration of where we're going actually allows us to make the difference because it's us that's actually changing the economy of where we're going.
So we have muscles and nerves and dermatomes. Dermatomes are how you feel on your skin, how your nervous system relays information to you from your skin back to your brain to know what the external world is feeding you. <coughs> okay? So imagine that those are like cards on a table. And you have muscles and you have nerves and we know about dermatomes. And then on the eastern side you have meridians and chakras and Ayurvedic nadis and all the different concepts that I spoke about before. These seem all like very separate concepts to us. However, <clears throat> however, if we take them and we lay them one on top of another instead of as if they're separate, suddenly we get a whole different perspective. And what I'm bringing you today is a concept of an idea of how when we do that and we stack these cards on top of each other, we actually start to see planes of energy through the body. And they all fit into each other like a jigsaw puzzle. So an analogy for that is imagine if you were taking a picture of where you live, of your home, and you took a picture of the front, and you took a picture of the side of the house, and of the top of the house, and you took a picture of the electrical wiring, and of the basement, and of the attic, all of the pictures would look very different. But it's not until you put them together that you get the concept of house. And what's, even though so many pieces of our history have been destroyed and burned over the years and lost through all the little, the, the, the large political contrivances that have happened throughout generations and generations of people, we still have maps left to us that allow us to piece together this story. And because of the experience that I had, I didn't know that where I was going to end up was amongst all of, of the people like ourselves who understand the nature of geometry. Now it's our art. It's in, we understand it's in our nature. We know it exists in our architecture. We know that it's the way harmonics move in music. Geometry is the language, in fact, of the entire universe. And so we're very much like fish who are discovering water for the first time. That's how I perceive this whole kind of concept of, of mental shift that's happening, is we're going from not just seeing castle and gravel, but imagining that we understand what water means. And our world of water is the matrix of oscillation and frequencies of wave and form that we now know create the ellipses and spirals of our planets around each other that allow us with our technology to actually see and understand the kind of geometric um, beautiful harmonic proportions that create all matter and therefore if they create all matter they create us and so biology is one of the last places that this kind of information any new technology it takes a good 50 years for for that information to come down to biology and change our daily life and so the vision that I've been carrying and that I've been working with and that has been revealed to me through my body and through the bodies of, of many people that I've been working on in my private practice is this story that mirrors exactly what's going on in the cosmos and exactly what physicists are discovering. And so this story of geometry that has really become the symbol of our epoch in many ways is really the story of your body and the story of how health and healing works in your body. So, for instance, there is, I, I did a cadaver program many years ago. Um, a cadaver program is when you dissect um, people who have donated their bodies, which my father did, in fact, actually, which freaked me out for some time. And then years later, I became such um, a student of the body that it was a real honor for me to, to walk in. And I worked with three different cadavers. One of the cadavers had died of cancer. He was in his early 40s, and he... Um, and that's really all we knew about him. But there's a way of understanding the geometries of the body. So I, I have 17 years of information to share with you and probably about 40 minutes left to give you a piece for yourself to take with you today. So I'm going to jump start you forward and there's a couple of pictures around the room. One is this one back here where you can see the idea of the life cycle moving through and you see these straight geometric lines. And there are major intersection points in the body just like there are major intersection points in nature. So even the way we build a city has to fall upon certain laws and lines of how the world is constructed. So imagine, for instance, if you live in LA, Hollywood and Vine is a pretty busy kind of intersection. And there are major, you know, Highland and La Brea over here is another busy intersection. And there's activity happening in between, yet those are the major areas where congestion is going to happen. And your body does the same thing energetically. So, when we worked on this one cadaver, I saw a little patch in the bottom of his leg. 
And this is showing you an aspect of the triad of the body. When we start getting into geometries and the five platonic solids and what they look like, which we'll get to in a moment, the prism, which is this white one here, the triangle, all geometries can be reduced to the triangle. And the triad, I found, is one of the best ways for you to be able to access the way your body shares tension and flow and the way different, even metastasis, will move through the body. So I saw a little patch in his leg because this is just a torso shot of what happens in the body. It gives you a really good basic understanding of how geometries and frequencies within your torso actually can show us a 3D and very fractal idea of oscillation and wave through the body. And that looks a little bit like the picture behind you where you can see the idea of chakras, you can see this middle form, which is really just showing you one fractal of a larger picture, and that it's not just the body that we're talking about, but that all frequency, and this is how we're connected with each other and with the cosmos, is based on these frequency oscillations and wave that connect us all in perfect, beautiful geometric, geometric harmonies. So I saw this patch in the bottom of this man's leg, because it doesn't just exist in the torso, it exists throughout. And I thought, all right, if I'm really seeing what I think I'm seeing, because this was the beginning of the journey for me, then his cancer, his lung cancer, is going to be lodged between the second and third rib on the right side, I decided. His liver is going to be so inflamed that there's going to be a reaction there. And in the lower right quadrant of his abdomen, there has to be something there to prove the kind of elevator system that the body will use within the geometry in order to try to balance energy for you. It's energy constantly bringing source in and moving source out. And our decisions are what block it or let it move. Right? So our decisions based on what we're consuming, how we're living, what we're doing with our life is exactly where we have the self-empowerment of the choice of connecting with source energy. Your nervous system is a sodium potassium pump that moves electrical energy through it because sodium and potassium pass over a permeable membrane and creates an electrical charge. The body is just electricity, lightning moving electricity moving through the body always connected to external source, which is part of this large 99.9999% vacuum. Your heart beats because there is a sinoatrial node in it, a little spot in your heart that for some unknown reason emits an electrical impulse with such regularity, like a crystal. If you put battery through a crystal and it can tell time for you, that's how your heart works. We don't know where the source energy comes from. It comes from offshore somewhere. And when I asked in physiology class back in the early 90s how this could be considered the genesis of life in the body, I was told that when I had a better answer, I could come back and let the class know. Mm. So I'm back. And so the sinoatrial node emits this electrical charge and it passes over what's called the Purkinje fibers and the bundle of Hiss. And that electrical charge ca causes contraction. So your heart is continually beating because of an electrical impulse that shows up from offshore and breathes life through you. So the idea of energy being some sort of woo-woo new age idea is just not practical anymore. We already have the science behind us that shows us where we're going and what we're doing. So when we dissected this particular giving man's body, his his tumor was so lodged between the second and third rib that we had to actually rip the lung out and the tumor stayed lodged because it kind of oscillates and starts to turn into and oscillates, ossifies. I've got oscillation on the brain and starts to turn into such dense cartilage it starts to look like the ribs, like bone. His liver was so inflamed that with the formaldehyde it had turned green and he had cirrhosis in his life by the end of his life. And there was a tumor in the right lower side, right lower quadrant of his abdomen that was the size of an orange. And at that time, according to the, the professor that was there, there was no connection between the tumor in the lower abdomen and the tumor in the lung. Now they understand there is actually a connection. And interestingly, the metastasis moves. Let's say you've got colon cancer in the lower quadrant of the body. It moves up to the middle of the body and it will move up into the top. Now that doesn't mean that metastasis only is there any more that there are only people at Hollywood and Vine and Highland and La Brea. People live in between, but the major components of what's going to take you into the next realm and away from here and take you down, so to speak, are going to be in major areas. 
So how does that translate to you? How many people have shoulder pain? That pain between your shoulder blades every once in a while that gets really like owie kind of thing, right? So imagine that that's really the core is not on the top, it's not on the back, it's not in that like really good spot you can get into. It's like a ping pong ball sitting right inside your right underneath the shoulder blade in the middle underneath what's known as the brachial plexus. It's the area where energy like a spiral pulls into itself. All of these areas do the same thing. So quick analogy, I'm driving to the burn two days from Southern California, long drive, back is bugging me, I'm feeling cranky and hot, getting dehydrated, and I can't, no matter where I'm moving and what I'm doing, my back is just bugging me. But I know that it's like a ping pong ball right in the center. It's not just about my back. It's not just about what's going on internally. So I lift my hand up underneath the, you know, the, the sunroof is open a little bit and I can slip my hand under there. That's the only place that I can move. And I drop my shoulder completely in order to be able to open this part of my body. And I start feeling an immediate stretch down my arm. And we're going to do this in a second. I'll give you a way that you can feel this meridian yourself. Meridians, I learned, actually weave into the three major lines of the body. Because those three major lines are not two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional and they, rec they recognize the spiral. And because our brains need to see two dimensions, don't let the two dimensions fool you. Because again, we're looking at an aspect of three dimensions. So by the time I could actually see between Western physiology and Eastern energy systems and what bodies were showing me and I could draw it out, I made this shape because I realized it wasn't a 2D version because I was looking into the body and every time I'm teaching workshops what people normally say that the main thing that they get out of it is they learn to work to core. So the whole idea is how to actually work to core into your own body. So I'm holding onto the thing and I'm dropping into my shoulder and I know I'm aiming for this ping pong ball here. And the only reason you can't feel sometimes the ping pong ball is because you're actually holding up because we don't recognize how much tension that we're holding, okay? So let's just try this for a second. Take your middle finger, not this one, but this one, and you're going to put it right in the corner of that little space just before your ear there, yeah? And you're going to bring your elbow out to the side and just drop into your pelvis for a second, right? So a lot of times, as soon as you pick your arm up, you pick your whole body up. But you don't need to do that, so take a moment to just settle into that crystal ball, which is your whole generative, generative center where all life comes from and creativity. Take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, really drop your shoulder, drop your chest, span your palm out, and feel as if you're trying to reach your elbow to the person next to you. And now drop another muscle in your chest here. And you see how that increases the sense of stretch you get through the elbow there? If you're not feeling a huge stretch, it's because you're not dropping really deep and down because there's so much tension that we hold up here that sometimes it takes some time to open the body and really drop into that sensation. Can people feel the stretch yeah. from the baby finger through the elbow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe starting to span up over the shoulder a little bit. That's your small intestine meridian. It actually ends right here where you've got your finger and it begins at your pinky finger. It's married to the heart meridian that is on the other side like a plane of energy moving through the body in that way. So if you can find that stretch and you can connect it to the ping pong ball in the middle of the chest where you can really feel that sensitivity, try that sometime if you've ever got back pain driving in a car where you can reach up and hold on to something above you, drop into that area. And then what I also did, because I'm a body geek, is I put my foot over my leg and there's another point in the side of the calf that carries a lot of energy to help balance what's going on in the hip. Okay, there's a lot involved in this, so I appreciate you just kind of going with the, the flow of, of, so we can just get to example for you. And, and the side handbar of the car pressed just in the right area of my thigh. So what I was doing was I was opening the bottom into my hip and I was opening the top into my hip so that it had some place to go because it was stuck down in my lower abdomen. And when I did that, I had no back pain whatsoever. So this is how the body is connected that way. 
And any time I took my hand down after a little while, it came back because I hadn't done yoga for three days. I'd been sitting in a car for two days and I was hot and I was dehydrated and I needed to go to yoga class and I needed to get some water into me. So until that was going to happen, my hip wasn't going to clear with the pain. But in the meantime, I could find ways to really get into the body and help release that. Okay? So imagining that these different parts of the body actually represent a beautiful geometry that is accessible to you gives you a way in. And the way in is your sensation. It's how you can feel. So there's as much theory involved as one wants to go, because I've compiled a great deal of it between the two. But the bottom line for you is increasing sensation, increasing awareness. And a lot of times we don't feel sensation because we have a negotiation with our subconscious that we don't want to feel. Because a lot of times feeling means pain. And pain and pleasure are like an elastic. And if you can only feel this much because you don't want to feel pain, that's as much pleasure as you're allowing yourself. So to actually renegotiate that and pull it forward, and you can do that. And I teach a, a stretch class called Somatic Stretch, and I have for over 25 years, created by my mother, who's a real pioneer in the field. And so I do a lot of yoga as well. And, and practices like that allow you to work, right? Right when you're in a really painful kind of place and your brain's going, I got stuff to do. Why are you here? I've got, I am busy and I've got appointments and it's time to go and get out of this class. That's the moment where you can say, can I deal with this actually? Can I just breathe for a second? And can I just renegotiate for a moment the contract between what I'm willing to feel and what I'm not willing to feel? And when we do that, we can actually gain sensation into the body to show us the map work of, of our own natural energy systems. So in the future of medicine, it's going to be like um, Dr. What's-Her-Name in Star Trek. Lovely woman who would always come in with that little scanner machine, right? And she'd be like, oh, well, I don't know what's wrong. And she'd say, well, this, this is happening in your liver, and this is, and we need this, and we do that. And that's the world of frequency that we're moving into. Currently, we have something called the electromagnetic spectrum. And how many are familiar with that term? Okay, so the electromagnetic spectrum is what we understand scientifically about frequency in the world. We know that it's infinite, but we don't actually know what the ends of it are because we've only discovered this much. Now this much are alpha rays and gamma rays, infrared rays, um, long and short radio waves, different things like that. And in the middle of that, like a thin, thin, thin little slice of cake is the entire rainbow spectrum, which is what allows us to see everything that we see. But what we've mapped are a sea of invisibles around it. And that's what allows us to do all of the technology that we do today, which is huge, right? Think of what our phones do, let alone what people up in the higher places are capable of doing. And what our technology is just leaping into, just like the Industrial Revolution, or on an even larger scale than that, is it's discovering more about the frequencies. And that idea of it's an infinite structure of a of spectrum, of the electromagnetic spectrum, is suddenly branching out even further all the way through. And we will not be able to discover any more frequencies without being able to pick them up in your body. And at that point, the entire game changes and medicine becomes something suddenly that you actually can tap into and make shifts with because you're the one who can recognize. But we don't even really need to wait for medicine to give us that green light because our own bodies are labs and our own level of sensation is what actually allows us to feel and make connections. What I've done is I've created a map work of concept between because my intellectual brain had to understand what the hell had happened to me. And my intuitive brain was going in and doing really amazing things in hands-on body work when I was working with people. And I was getting reactions in bodies that a lot of other, really any other therapist that I was speaking to were not relating to what I was talking about. And it was a very isolating, confusing time for me. Meanwhile, I was having sensations through my body that were freaking me out, that I didn't understand. I didn't, it's one thing to feel alive, and it's another thing to feel something alive inside of you. <laughs> and so it was a very strange period where I was working all of that out. 
But in the meantime, I was able to actually go in and track all of these different spaces where we can go in and actually see and feel that sensation. And then it brings out into a world of geometry. And if you're not yet familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, with the golden ratio, with what science is discovering, with what astrophysicists are discovering in the cosmos, cosmologists, you see it in the fractality of art in all ways. This is really the nervous system watching itself watch itself. And that's why when you look at geometry, like if you look at this piece of geometry, this is what I ended up pulling out of the body. And I was like, okay, so that explains the theory of things running together. And it allowed my, sub my intuitive mind that was doing cool stuff, because my intuitive mind was doing cool stuff, and my, my logical mind was saying, you can't just do that. You can't, like, what, like, you can't just pass go with no explanation. Like, give us a reason. So I've spent 17 years trying to give myself a reason, and I've compiled a really interesting series of information that come together, and now it doesn't stop my intuitive mind. Not everyone needs that, but I needed that. I needed something for my intuitive mind to have the go-ahead to actually go in and do what it was doing already. So a lot of people in workshops will say, I always wondered why I did that, and now I understand why. And that kind of lets us move even further into what we're doing and into the map work of our own bodies. So if the cadaver showing me that I was on the right track wasn't enough, by the time I actually saw it, I thought, well, even if I'm wrong, it looks really cool. <laughs> So watching geometry spin, which is something that we're really working with, is again like the nervous system watching itself watch itself. Because the nervous system is frequency. And so it's watching a picture of itself. Kind of like theater, watching a dramatic reenactment on stage. It's kind of the same way that we observe the space of our own living and breathing. So I want to show you an idea of the five platonic solids. Who's familiar with the five platonic solids? Just so I can get the room read a little bit. Okay, a good number of you. The five platonic solids are only called platonic, not because they don't get together, because clearly they do. They nestle into each other very well. But Plato um, kind of brought a resurgence of interest back around them um, in, in Greek times, which is, of course, the basin of our civilization. And the five platonic solids are five shapes that were actually carved into Neolithic rock. They're in the British Museum somewhere in London. And we don't really know where they first came from, but what we would describe them today as being is a way of understanding. Let's say, let's say you're a fish, and you're swimming around in your fishbowl, and you think that the world is about the castle and the gravel and your physical body. But then eventually the shift of consciousness comes along and you recognize water for the very first time. And someone comes up to you and says, this is a picture of your world. And they hand you a picture of molecules of water, of oxygen and hydrogen. And it looks like geometry because atomic structure is geometric. DNA is geometric. The way planets move around each other are geometric. And the way you eat and breathe and procreate and digest and literally have this alchemy of food that becomes flesh and blood and bone that we take for granted often is geometric in nature once we start getting into the depth of it. So the fish might think, well, that's really interesting, but you know, what does that geometry have to do with me? And then you have to recognize that you need to take the, the molecule of oxygen and hydrogen and you need to expand that out into a larger concept. And that's kind of the idea of a fractal. You've got one shape and yet it explains all of the rest of the interrelationships of shape. So geometry is a way really of measuring physical space. It's the way of understanding the castle to the gravel to the fish's body and extrapolations on its relationship to one another. Sacred geometry is tracking the water and understanding that there's water in the body of the fish that there are molecules that are involved in the entire spectrum and in that way. And so that's why I say we're kind of like fish that are discovering water for the very first time. So these five shapes are really a way, imagine for a moment that we could see all of the internet rays in here and we could see the x-rays that move through here and the infrared rays. It would be oscillation and wave or we could connect points between where they meet each other and draw lines between them and make geometries that continually move out and play like a mirror upon each other, smaller to larger, and yet they remain the same. Like people coming out of people. 
the smaller to the larger, the macrocosm to the microcosm. Or if you're looking at a raindrop on a window and there's a mountain scene behind you, you see the entire scene in that little drop of water. That's a fractal too. A great way to describe a fractal, and I'm about to describe to you something that um, would get anybody killed if they discovered it, because it would be heresy. And that is that when you take the five platonic solids, we've got inside an icosahedron, the gold one in here, an octahedron around it, which is like two pyramids, base to base. You've got a prism, which is like a pyramid, all around that. And then the purple here is the cube that goes all around that, and they all fit into each other like Russian dolls, perfectly, with no complaints. And then around that, you have the dodecahedron, which you can see there, the pentagon goes around. Now this isn't static. This isn't just the fish and the castle and the gravel. It moves. It's just that our brain needs to take a snapshot of a freeze frame, like this picture over here, or this shape here, to get an idea of what we're talking about. And yet, it's not static and it continually moves. So if you take a point from each end of this, and of this pentagon, and you bring them to a point all the way around like a little witch's hat, that's called stellating the dodecahedron. And when you do that, imagining a beautiful star-like shape, you've all seen that shape, right? If you connect the dots of each of the ends of the witch's hats all the way around, and you connect the dots, you end up with the icosahedron again. And in that way, it continues to expand out forever, and ever and ever, or it can contract back in forever and ever and ever. So when you're talking about geometries and frequencies, this is really a map of understanding all of the different transmutations and angles possible in our world of oscillation and wave. It represents every angle, but it's not just a stick. It's a whole plane running through. And imagine how complicated this would look if you saw a plane of every single angle available in this. We would barely be able to look at it and comprehend it. It would just be a light source that just spans out. Like if you're swimming in a lake and you open your eyes and you see a light source and it's just like a, a whole refraction of light in a million different areas. It's very hard for the brain to grasp the angulations possible, and so this is one way of looking at it. And so this is each ping pong ball in your body. This is each one of your chakras. This is the interrelationship between them. And this is how, in the frequencies moving out, your body really just represents a thin veil between the interior and the exterior, which is just one wave of oscillation, and it's just moving right through you. And we have the experience within just the physical body of what's going on. And what, where we're going is actually dissolving that concept into a fractal state, which interestingly, Stanislav Grof, who's a brilliant, if you don't know Stanislav Grof, please look him up. He's amazing, um, amazing researcher in his 80s now. He discovered that in, entheo in the entheogenic world, if you're taking a plant medicine or what have you, one of the first places you go to is a fractal space. When you start to dissolve your brain, the first place you go to is the interrelationships of all things. And sometimes it freaks the mind out because it's having to dissolve its conditioning of belief of this and die to itself in order to see something that can actually continue ad infinitum. And so in that picture behind you there, you can see the different ideas. Maybe you can see a little bit more now with that explanation, how detail can, of oscillation and wave can actually span out from the body, the interior, and how it meets the exterior. And like a shadow, because I'm, I've studied acupuncture for many years, the meridian system to me is where that shadow meets the line, like a crystal. We're like crystalline structure atomic crystalline structure. And imagine that the light source is not coming from out here and going through a crystal and expressing a prism on the other side, but that that light source is your spine. That light source is your brain. It's the whole column. That light source is the generative center that for no reason that we understand creates from union of the divine masculine and feminine and literally creates life. It literally creates everything that we see and everything that is man-made comes from this power center that is like crystalline energy that spans out in all directions and the prism is you. 
And where that prism meets your skin is where the ancients have tracked and called the it's, it's an ancient way of tracking the nervous system because the nervous system is this expression of this crystalline nature of refraction of light. And so where it meets the skin and where they drew the lines are what the meridian system is, what the meridian system is considered. Now that's nothing I learned in acupuncture school. That's what the body has taught me. And because I know a lot about the theory of acupuncture, I also posit the theory that when we look at how certain aspects of the acupuncture system are set up, we're actually shown that there is a code to understand the geometry in what's called the six divisions of Chinese medicine. And so whether we're looking, what's beautiful about geometry is that whether we're looking at music or the body or ancient ways of tracking the body and putting it all together, whether we're looking at nature, whether we're looking at sacred architecture and how architecture was building upon things. Once you lay geometry over that, it explains the interrelationship between all things. And suddenly nothing is separate because we're all talking about the same thing. So I want to give you an exercise. Just sit with your legs out and your feet about a foot apart your legs out to the side. Ground yourself into the middle of that, of that crystal ball. Bring your knees out to the side, feet here. And start pressing in little circles down the inside of your calf. Not just on the surface, right? Massage is about a lot of this. And it's not. It's about going in to the body. So your brain needs to think in to the middle of where you're touching, not just on the surface. And that allows you to activate the nervous system. So as you're pressing in little circles and releasing, and pressing and releasing, explore your own sensation. Drop your shoulders, drop your chest, and find the owie points in there. Take a couple of deep breaths in. And exhale. And in. And exhale. Every, is everyone finding some good owie points? Yeah. So this is the way that your body is doing two things. The torso, Chinese medicine is awesome because they have these, these things that we learn that are just things you learn by rote. Like the hara, which is the torso, it's considered sometimes the lower body, but the whole body. The hara is where the 10,000 diseases arise from. Great phrase, didn't make much sense to me until I started seeing it in the body. And so what your body is doing is those owie points in your calf are helping share the load of attention in your torso to make the complexity simple, right? It's a family, your body. It doesn't want any one area to get loaded down. So it finds other areas of the body in order to share that load. And that's one area where it's helping share the load. So it doesn't matter if you're recognizing the geometry involved or what have you. You're, as long as you're working into an area where you're feeling kind of an always sensitive point, work into the body. Let just the light from your thumb go through the center of it and you can help unlock something in the upper torso and you'll start to feel that and in that way you become acquainted and a participant with your own geometry a participant instead of just an observer and in the lower part of the body there's a little point it's called spleen six in acupuncture and that part of your body is contraindicated for women in pregnancy particularly in the first trimester because it can really affect the uterus so profoundly that it can cause miscarriage if the body's fragile and if the baby hasn't really held yet. So this is the lower part of the body. So you want to see the cool fractal of your body? You've got lower, middle, and upper. Go into the upper part of the calf here. Go into the upper part of your calf and it's like you can feel a walnut in there and it's an owie pain, right? You have that pain between your shoulder blades again? Go for that point. And that will help you unlock the middle part of your back. So you're feeling a way that your body is not only helping share the load, 
in other areas of the body and pack it into different areas. This is why reflexology works or auricular acupuncture because the body is mirroring everywhere else the same story. What's going on in your shoulder is going on in your hip. What's going on in the upper part of the body is going on in the upper part of the leg. It's fractal and so you, the three, the triad, is one of the easiest ways to access this kind of information through the body. And the key, regardless of whether you intellectually understand it or not, is the sensation. Go for your sensation. Increase your sensation because that way you connect with the living matrix of your own architecture. So whether it's understood or not, go further down here. At the back along here, I find a lot of intestinal congestion. You can open up a lot in the lower body by working in through that whole area. If you're constipated, if you have different things going on, or pain, diarrhea, anything, just go for sensation. It's one of the easiest parts of your body to access, to start the exploration of your own interior. Galileo said, the universe cannot be read until we have learned the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language and the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures without which means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. And that's the beauty of the technology that we're walking into. Isaac Newton also said, the changing of bodies into light and light into bodies is very comfortable to the course of nature, which seems delighted with transmutations. And then Hippocrates said, everyone has a doctor in him or her. We just have to help it in its work. So I want you to consider not only these points on your body, the kind of geometries that you can work with, with yourself, but also consider that diet, politically, what's going on with our food systems, with our environmental stuff, we're all activists in one way or another. This is my activism. This is my way of sharing the self-empowerment and the beauty of the vision of where we're going when we're looking at how the ancients have always worked this way. Because it's us who are going to be healthy in either in surgical rooms or not. It's us who needs doctors or not. And so understanding that we have ways of working with our own body is critical in self-empowerment and healing and not reacting in fear to something. So even something as simple as every morsel of food you put in your mouth. Consider for a moment when you eat that it doesn't matter what you put in your mouth. Your body is an alchemical lab that takes anything and literally alchemizes it into blood and flesh and bone, and hormones, and neurotransmitters, and emotions. And so I want to leave you with a concept of what the ritual that I like to do before I eat food, aside from giving thanks for where it came from, is I look at it and I consider for a moment, when this food becomes my flesh, and my bone, and my blood, and my thoughts, and my feelings, and my inspiration, how do I want to feel? Where do I see myself being and living in the world? Because that's a literal truth. There is nothing metaphorical about the fact that you are what you eat. And so thank you for being the pioneers that you are in the world. And thank you for coming today to listen for what I hope is an inspiration of where it is that we're moving in the future. And that our medicine, despite all of the, um, the seeming controversies that we have between Western and Eastern medicine, I believe are fully coming to a close with the advancing technology that we're moving into. It's a very exciting time and it's up to all of us to decide what we're eating, who we're associating with, whether we're getting our asses off the couch, whether we're forcing ourselves to look at our depressions, at our addictions, at our thriving and coming to a place again, which has always been on the planet, of thriving instead of just surviving. So thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Uh -huh.